Good morning and welcome to worship at Bethesda United Methodist Church. My name is Reverend Jenny Cannon. I'm the lead pastor here at BUMC and so grateful to have all of you worshiping with us today. I want to take a moment and invite you to fill out one of the electronic connect cards and you can find information about that in the details below this broadcast on our YouTube channel and to click on that and use it to share any greetings or messages you'd like to pass along to our staff as well as any prayer concerns that you want to be lifted up. I also want to let you know that in your weekend update, you see information about our ongoing racial justice ministry. And two of the things that are happening in coming weeks are a letter from our bishop that was put out this week describing some of the ways that the conference is in ministry and supporting racial justice efforts in local congregations. And a Howard Thurman retreat that will be coming up in partnership with several other local United Methodist congregations in our area. And you can see information about that in your weekend update. And good morning. My name is Reverend Scott Bostick. I'm the associate pastor. I extend my greetings as well to all of you. A few more announcements for you. Uh, our Altar in the World sermon series is continuing along with our two opportunities for you to be in study. With that, Reverend Jenny is leading a group on Tuesdays at 1230, and I'll be leading our Beyond Sunday School class uh, discussing uh, the topic from today's sermon at 11 o'clock just after worship today. Uh, you can contact either one of us for the Zoom information to access that. Also, our youth will be back together uh, tonight at 6.30 for middle school and high school Sunday school and for UMYF uh, to follow at uh, 7 o'clock. And last but not least, 
Uh, we are starting up a virtual coffee hour that will follow this service immediately. Uh, that is also available via Zoom. Uh, and there was a link to that in the morning email as well as you can comment uh, here or uh, send us an email at Bethesda UMC and wash more feet to get the Zoom link for that. We really hope that you'll be a part of that experience with us today. I invite you to join me now in our opening prayer. The words will be on the screen. God of us all, we gather in your presence with praise and thanksgiving for the faithful love you have shown toward your people for the many blessings you have given to us. Thank you for your faithful presence among us, even when we are not fully aware of it. Continue to reveal yourself to us. Open our eyes to see you here among us. Open our spirits to receive your word. For surely you are with us in this place. For surely you are with us in this place. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please join us in our opening hymn, Maker in Whom We Live, found on page 88 of your hymnal. All right. Welcome everybody to our children's message today. Those of you who are able to join us on Zoom and those of you who are watching on YouTube today, we are so happy to have you. 
We wanted to talk with you a little bit today about our bodies and about how our bodies can be a way that we know and experience God. And so I wanted to talk for a second about bumps and bruises on our bodies. Have you all ever gotten any bumps and bruises? Actually, Scar- just a couple of days ago, I fell off an electric scooter and this is what happened. Ooh. Oh, Not boom. I always, I always get bruises. It's better than my cut on my head. A cut on your head? You had a cut on your head? I had a cut on my head too. No, it was like. Whoa. Do you have a, is there a scar head? from it? Um, yes, but it's in my hair. It's literally, I literally had to have stitches. Wow. I had a blister in my toe once. Yeah, and I got, I got a thorn, well, a splinter out of me just this morning. And oh, I one time was walking up the stairs with my hands in my pockets, and I tripped and fell, and I have a little scar on my nose right here from it because I. You could break nose. your nose then. Yeah, I broke my nose. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Clara, what were you gonna say? You broke your nose. He's broken his he nose. He also poked his face through a prickly, like bush, and got a thorn right. Like on his ear. Oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah, that must have not feel good. That doesn't sound fun. I'm fun, fun. I got a scar on my arm. I don't know if you all can see. I'll show you this section of my arm. And that happened when a friend and I, we were in a kitchen cooking, and we had some hot grease in a pan. And somebody went and put something in a pan, and that grease splattered out and my arm was right there <laughs> so it was quite the burn and it was quite the scar that happened many many years ago so it's faded away but there's still a little bit of a reminder that I need to be careful when I'm in the kitchen with hot grease. that right here whoa I got stung by a bee on my shoulder while rolling down a hill once does that leave a scar no. Okay. It just hurt. It just hurt. It yeah. 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 So my best scar is when I, I have it right here under my eye and right I was riding a jet ski and it flipped over and I hit the water really hard and had this amazingly giant black eye, but also a really big cut right here that has left a, left a scar under my eye. And mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we were thinking that you all had some pretty amazing stories about some bumps and bruises and scars and cuts that you have, and you did not disappoint. I you do. I also got my well, knee. When I was little, I, I fell down, and, and I got this big scrape under my nose, and Ooh. there's a scar now. Oh, yeah. it's right there. I, Welcome to the Scar Club. I <laughs> Well, yeah, uh, well uh, huge my mom didn't have a scar, but she did get a burn because she was going to get her hot, I remember, I remember, her hot fudge ice cream and it, it burned her hand, the cup burned her hand. You know what though? Fudge. Totally worth it. Totally worth it. See, hot now, now I never want hot fudge or to ride a jet ski. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, so one of the things that it happens when we have a body is that it gets bumped and bruised, right? We get scrapes, we get cuts. Do you think that God wants us to take care of our bodies? And burns. That's right. That's right. So do you think that God wants us to take care of our bodies? Yes. 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 Yeah, that's right. But does that mean that we can avoid all the scars and the bumps and the bruises and the cuts? No, because if we, if we, if we, did oh. then we would be and practically when we went outside to play we'd be so careful we would walk super slowly and not like go you know prickly bushes like i do i even play in a prickly bush which is yeah. not a good idea there's yeah, a prickly no. bush next to my um house and i have i've gotten poked everywhere a lot yeah yeah, you have to be careful. Yeah. Well, the only way I'd be playing in a prickly bush if I had a full set of knight's armor. Ah, well, that would be one way to go about it. That is for sure. 
Yeah. But one of the things that I think that can give us hope is that Jesus had a body, right? And Jesus walked around. And I bet you that Jesus, at some point in his life, had a bump or a bruise or a scrape. And that in going around doing his life and his ministry and in serving people and in loving people, that he got a little banged up because that's part of what happens with our bodies. And so we need to take care of our bodies and to love them and take care of them and help make sure that we honor and respect our bodies and other people's bodies because they're a gift from God. They're the house that we live in, right? But we can also know that having the chance to have some of these scars, bumps, and bruises is also the way that we live. And that that's part of what happens when we're out serving God and living and loving in the world. And so we don't need to be afraid of them. And we can instead know that that's a little bit of a way of telling our story, that we all have these stories that we tell about what's happened and places where we've been and, and moved and had fun. And that also that's a way that we can know that God is continuing to call us on to live and to serve even more. So we hope that you will use your bodies to love God and to live in the world and to have fun and to take care of them and to rest. And also to know that there is probably a lot more scars and bumps and bruises to come. And that that is part of the joy of being alive. Right? Yep. Right. Right. All right. Can you all say a prayer with me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dear God. Dear God. God. Dear God. Thank you for our bodies. Thank you for our bodies, for all that they are, for all that, that they are. are, for helping to protect us, for well, helping to protect us, us. giving us a way to serve you, for for giving us a way to serve you. To serve you. Mm-hmm. Help us to live, help, help us to live, live. And, move. and move, and let you, and let, and let you live in us. Live in us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we pray. pray. Amen. 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 Beloved, in difficult and troubling times, words of affirmation, the creeds of our faith that name who we are as the people of God are especially important. I invite you to now join me in a new creed borrowed from our siblings in the United Church of Canada. The words will be on your screen. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen our judge and our hope in life in death in life beyond death god is with us we are not alone thanks be to god we come now to the time in our service when we invite you to share your gifts to support the ministries of bethesda united methodist church There are two ways that you can give online today, either by texting to 301-679-7277 or by going to washmorefeet.org backslash give. We're also able to receive checks in the church office, and we thank you for your support and generosity and the ways that you continue to share your gifts and in service to God through the ministry of this church. Today's offertory anthem was recorded by our choir members remotely from their own homes. While it's not the same as singing together, it's great to hear their voices making music again.
A reading from Luke, chapter 8, verses 43 through 48. A woman was there who had been bleeding for 12 years. She had spent her entire livelihood on doctors, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the hem of his clothes, and at once her bleeding had stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When everyone denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are surrounding you and pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. When the woman saw that she couldn't escape notice, she came trembling and fell before Jesus in front of everybody. She explained why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. Daughter, your faith has healed you, Jesus said. Go in peace. Listen for what the Spirit is saying. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me, please? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So one of the unexpected side effects of doing so many online activities these days is the chance to see all of my physical features on screen a lot. And so in addition to noticing the growing number of gray hairs and forehead lines that I have the chance to see up close and personal on all these Zoom calls, and they're apparently beyond the bounds of the Zoom touch-up feature, I've also become very aware of some of my physical quirks, like my tendency to squint my eyes and cock my head when I'm really emphatic about something, or how much I gesture with my hands when I talk which is especially strange when they're also disappearing into a virtual background that's behind me. Our bodies are not just static. They move, they change, they grow. And while they certainly don't define all of who we are, they are an essential part of what makes us, us. In chapter three from An Altar in the World, Barbara Brown Taylor describes how many of us tend to be critical of our own bodies even to the point of covering them up as much as possible so that we don't have to look at them. She calls this chapter the practice of wearing skin and suggests that we should practice not only looking at and appreciating our own bodies and all of their bruised, bent, wrinkled, hairy, bald, sagging glory, but that recognizing the gift of our own in fleshedness is also essential to understanding God's presence in the word made flesh. She writes in this chapter, so whether you are sick or well, lovely or irregular, there comes a time when it is vitally important for your spiritual health to drop your clothes, look in the mirror and say, here I am. This is the body like no other that my life has shaped. I live here. This is my soul's address. Now I love that description. This is my soul's address. And the miracle of the incarnation, of course, is that one of these human bodies has been God's address too. God with us, God's promise, God's embodiment, God's salvation in the person of Jesus Christ, who was born and breathed, who bled and laughed, who even died. So God not only created and breathed life into our human bodies, but inhabited one as well which makes a pretty good case for why we should honor and respect bodies and bodily functions, rather than feel embarrassed or ashamed by them. But part of what we have to overcome here, of course, is that the church hasn't always done a great job, or let's be honest, even an adequate job, of helping us to celebrate the holiness of the body. We've been a lot more likely to shame and demonize the body and anything that goes along with it. Now, maybe this stems in part from our Judeo-Christian heritage and the purity and holiness codes that date back to the earliest days of the Israelite people in the Hebrew scriptures. But those rituals and codes were meant to cultivate a sense of identity, to honor God with particular ways of living, not to diminish the human experience. And so mixed in with social expectations, changing cultural norms, along with just some good old fashioned patriarchy and fear, somewhere along the line, the Christian tradition became a lot more suspicious of the body than it did to recognize it as a gift from God. Everything having to do with flesh and blood got lumped together into this category of unholy and immoral rather than vulnerable and sacred. 
So rather than focus on how best we honor God with and through our bodies, we veered off pretty sharply in the direction of in spite of our bodies, invoking shame and secrecy about our physicality, especially anything having to do with pleasure or sexuality, which has left generations of people raised in the church struggling to reconcile the experience of having a physical body with physical needs and longings with the God who apparently just wants them to ignore all that or even feel sorry for having it in the first place. Now, self-denial and sacrifice are an essential part of the Christian tradition, and they can be genuine ways to grow in our faith. They are much of what the early monastic tradition was founded on, and there is nothing wrong with modesty. But it's important that we not confuse genuine sacrifice and righteous living with arbitrary moral standards that are based on simply being suspicious of anything that involves skin. Bodies aren't our enemy. We can have a healthy theology of the body and even of human sexuality, but it takes honesty and thoughtfulness and care and a willingness to talk about it at all. So we've got some work to do in this practice of claiming wearing skin as an altar in the world to believe that we can practice our faith in our body rather than have to overcome it to really meet God. A scripture reading for today is a story of skin and flesh and blood that appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospel. And in each version, Jesus' encounter with the woman who's made well is encased within this larger story of Jesus going to the house of Jairus, a synagogue leader whose young daughter has fallen ill. Now, there are a month's worth of sermons that can be preached on this passage. But for today's purpose, I want to highlight where the body and physical experiences come into play. So to begin with, we have Jesus surrounded by people, bodies pressing all around him as he gets off the boat from a trip across the Sea of Galilee. Now, Jesus was a people person. That's how he spent his ministry. And yet, I still can't imagine this was an especially pleasant experience to be hemmed in by crowds of sweaty people touching him and asking questions and begging to be healed or forgiven. But we find him in these situations over and over again in the Gospels, surrounded by people. And in this story, in addition to the crowds, we also have Jairus, who enters the story by throwing himself down at Jesus' feet, asking him to come and heal his daughter. It's not surprising that Jairus would come to Jesus because that's what Jesus does, engage people in physical ways, touching, healing, teaching them. And so that's already something to pay attention to. Jesus was not cruising around Galilee in the first century version of an armored car. He didn't have Jairus submit his healing request through the proper authorities. Jesus was right there with and among people and their bodies, responding to their needs. And so we don't hear his response, but it's clear that after Jairus makes this request, that Jesus sets off on the way to Jairus's house to go and heal his daughter. Now the crowds are still pressing in, of course, and it's here that we learn that among this crowd is a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years, who spent all of her money on doctors, none of whom could heal her. There is a lot of speculation about what kind of bleeding this woman was suffering from. Was it a continuous menstrual cycle? Did she have some kind of hemorrhoids? We don't know the medical condition for sure. What we do know is that she was suffering and that she was desperate to be healed because she kept trying to seek treatments through all those years. I mean, who wouldn't? And it's important that we see here this experience of someone having a chronic medical condition represented in the scriptures because that is something that is a reality for many people who are struggling with it quietly for much of their lives. But that's exactly what was going on here. This woman, her pain, her suffering, it went well past the point where people were bringing casseroles or sending cards anymore. She had been struggling with this for 12 years and she was likely pretty isolated because of it. So maybe her very existence is a reminder for us to make sure that we continue to care for and to notice those among us who are burdened with long-term ailments and health conditions. And while it's not explicit here, it's also generally understood that based on the purity laws of the time, this woman would have been considered unclean because of this condition. Whatever the cause for her bleeding, the fact that it was happening would have kept her in this perpetual state of uncleanliness and prevented her from fully participating in the life of the village and the synagogue. Now that's nothing new. 
as much as our bodies are a part of our common experience, time and time again, we have used them to divide and wield power over each other. And so it's worth asking the question, not only of ourselves, but of our communities and our societies, whose look or smell has caused us to avert our eyes or to change seats? What physical abilities have we prized or body types have we idealized? What skin color has become the stand-in for normal? Whose bodies have we ignored or degraded because they didn't make themselves worthy or able enough? This woman has a body, but it's one that's been wounded and ostracized. And it's in this kind of physical state that this woman makes her way into the crowd, maybe the only way that she would have been able to get close to Jesus in the first place. And she discreetly touches the fringe of his clothes. What faith that must have taken, what desperation and courage she must have had. And immediately the scripture says her bleeding stopped. Now I can't imagine how it must have felt to be this woman suffering from this condition for 12 years, facing disappointment after disappointment, just to have it finally stop, full stop, in the moment that she touched Jesus' cloak. Jesus immediately notices it though, and asks, who touched me? And everyone in the crowd kind of backs up, murmuring, not me, not me. Peter gently reminds Jesus that he's in the middle of a crowd, so lots of people are touching him. But Jesus doesn't let it go. He insists that someone touched him, that he even noticed the power physically going out of him when it happened. It wasn't just the crowds surrounding him. And so the woman, realizing that she's going to be revealed one way or another, comes falling down before Jesus, confessing that it was she that touched him, why she did so, and that she was healed. Now, we don't hear about the reaction of the crowd to this announcement. Were they skeptical of this lady's story? Judgy that she had dared to touch Jesus in the first place? Surprised that it had actually worked? For his part, Jesus simply says, daughter, your faith has made you well, go in peace. Now, a really interesting commentary that I read described this encounter as a kind of reversal of the traditional way that holiness and purity were thought to work in a religious sense. Whereas previously, people considered unclean were thought to defile others by their very presence, it didn't work the other way around. It took a purification ritual in order for someone who was unclean to become clean. A holy or sacred person, though, couldn't rub off or undefile someone who was thought to be impure. But in this case, it seems that Jesus had the ability and the power to transform and to make this woman well and clean. And though she was considered unclean, she was made well. But the power of her faith in Jesus, the power that flowed out of him, initiated by her own touch, perhaps breaking down some of the walls that had been artificially created between clean and unclean to begin with. Now, one important thing to notice here is that in all three accounts, Jesus doesn't say to the woman, your faith has healed you. Jesus says your faith has made you well. And I wonder about the difference between being made well or being healed. How are those connected? Is one possible without the other? In this story, it seems that both may have happened. But I suspect that our embodied faith and living with the limits and the possibilities of what our bodies can and can't do is another way of grappling with that. We can be in good shape physically, of course, and still very aware that we are not truly well. And likewise, I have known people whose bodies have been broken in ways too numerous to count. People who are wounded or sick or even dying who have reminded me what it means to be made well and whole in God's love. Not just after their death either, but even in their bodily experience too. This practice of wearing skin is something that can be fragile and fraught and also a way of recognizing God's holy breath running through us, sustaining us. And I think that on a very basic level, the story acknowledges that. That life is hard, but touch matters. Bodies matter. How much do we know that now? And it's part of the way that we can even encounter God's healing and transforming work. So treating one another, treating our bodies with dignity and respect, that should be part of our mission as Christ followers. And not something that's just tacked onto the side of our faith, 
not just a project that we get around to after we finish the real work of attending to our inner spiritual life. Caring for people's bodies is what some people are called and gifted to do professionally. And this is a season when we really can't say thank you enough to the doctors and nurses and aides and therapists and all the healthcare workers who are in our midst. The caring about people's bodies and their physical health and wholeness, that is all of our work. Our theology of bodies doesn't stop at our own skin. So whether it's as simple as choosing to wear a mask or as broad as working for basic laws that uphold the dignity of all people on any side of a border, whether it's as intimate as holding a loved one's hand or as public as kneeling down in witness, we can use our own bodies to serve and love other people's bodies too. And it's part of what faith incarnate, God in flesh and blood, calls us to. Now there's one final detail from this story that I don't want us to miss. As I mentioned earlier in all three accounts of this story, when the woman is healed, it is embedded in the story, a larger narrative of Jairus' plea to heal his daughter. And in each version, when Jesus stops in the crowd because he feels the woman's touch, he's delayed on his way to Jairus' house. So right after our reading for today ends, Jairus receives the news that his daughter has actually died while Jesus was on the way. Jesus' detour in stopping to engage with and respond to this woman means that he didn't make it in time to save the young girl. And yet in each version of this story, Jesus goes to the house of Jairus, stepping right in the middle of the wailing and the weeping and the disappointment. And Jesus takes that little girl by the hand and says, young woman, rise up. And he brings her back to life. Now we raise this because it reminds us that in God's kingdom and in Jesus's work, that there is time to spend on those who need to be healed. And that that time and effort does not take away from what else God might be doing. In fact, it's perhaps an important way of how we understand the fullness of what God is doing. So this woman's life mattered, just as Jairus' daughter's life mattered. Both their lives were worthy and precious. And stopping to respond to this brave and hurting woman in front of him did not inhibit Jesus' ability to redeem and transform. And so when we think about this practice of wearing skin in this particular day and time, I think it means that we should also be able to say boldly and with great faith, for example, that black lives matter without somehow fearing that that means that other lives do not matter or matter less. Taking time to respond to and care for what's in front of us, for the injustice and the pain that's being named specifically in the black community right now leaves plenty of room for God to continue working among all of us and maybe even to have a better understanding of what God is doing and to be able to offer ourselves more fully to that work. So perhaps we might understand this practice of wearing skin not just as a way of coming to terms with the holiness of our own bodies, their failings, their flaws, their quirks, but also as a way of thinking about God's presence, stretched across the whole of human experience, reminding us in all of our different kinds and colors of skin, in our wounds and in our scars, in our ability to love and create and heal and grow, that human life is indeed human. It is flawed, it is finite, but it is also hallowed. The word has been made flesh among us. And God still got skin in the game. Thanks be to God. Amen. Dear ones, as we now come to our time of congregational prayer, I invite you to share the prayers and the thoughts that are on your hearts and on your minds in this time. You can share those one of two ways. You can share them in the chat box in this YouTube video, or you can share them via email with us at BethesdaUMC at washmorefeet.org. You know that all that you share with us in prayer will be held in our prayers in the week to come. Will you join me now as we pray together? Eternal God, hallowed be your name. Early in the morning before we begin our work, we praise your glory. 
Renew our bodies as fresh as the morning flowers. Open our inner eyes as the sun casts new light upon the darkness. Deliver us from all captivity. Like the birds of the sky, give us wings of freedom to begin a new journey. As a mighty stream running continuously, restore justice and freedom day by day. God, we thank you for the gift of this morning and a new day to work with you. And so, God, as temples of your spirit, as your hands and feet in the world, we come to you now to pray, offering the things that are on our hearts as we pray together and name aloud in our hearts or in writing for the people of this congregation who need your prayers, O oh God. For those who suffer and those in trouble. For the people of this congregation, especially for Carl Eichenwald, Gail Smith, Etadel McHale, Ruby Song, Sue Mitchell, Brady Gunnerson, Mary Fryer, Rachel Bender, Marion Fultz. For those who suffer and those in trouble, for those who are sick and recovering from COVID-19, for those who are affected by this pandemic in their ability to connect with others. For those in need of work that is safe and will support their families and them. We pray for the concerns of this local community for safe spaces, for people to continue doing what is right to stop the spread of this disease, for people to spread love and battle racism and bigotry, xenophobia, and the other diseases of our time that divide us. We pray for the world, its peoples, and its leaders. For the elected and appointed leaders of our region, our states, and of our nation, for the leaders of countries around our world, for people who are already struggling before this virus and global pandemic began. for those who feel crushed by oppressive systems, for those who are denied full dignity in this world. We pray for the church universal, its leaders, its members, and its mission. for our denomination, the United Methodist Church, and its work locally and across our globe to end racism and bigotry. For people who focus more on what divides us than on what unites us. 
God, forgive us and show us a better way. For those who are away from their families and loved ones in service to your church, O oh God. For all the people who call upon you in faith, but have yet to receive the answer to their prayers. God, be a balm and make your presence with them known. For all those who are struggling in faith this day to understand how you are at work in our world. In communion with the saints and all your company of heaven, O oh God, we pray these things as we pray together the prayer which Christ has taught us in whatever language or version is dearest to your heart. Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And we say together, Amen. Please join us in our closing song, We Are the Body of Christ, found in The Faith We Sing on page 2227. Thank you again for joining us for worship today and a reminder that we will have a virtual coffee break immediately after this service. And so you can send an email to Bethesda UMC at Wash More Feet or make a note in the comments now so that we can follow up and share the Zoom link with you. We thank you for your presence here and all the ways that you continue to be an embodied church, even in this time. And may the blessing of God our Fill your body, fill your days, and may you know the presence of God's saving and redeeming work with each and every breath. Go in peace. Amen.